Lay aside immaturity is some advice that I wish I could have heeded when I was a sophomore in high school. I remember vividly going to my class right after lunch, which was, of course, the hardest time to pay attention, probably the hardest time to teach now that I think about it. I see some nods in the crowd there, yeah. Well, I've told many of you before that I, I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church and went to mostly Roman Catholic schools growing up. But by the time we moved from, from Illinois to Florida, we had become sort of those uh, Easter and Christmas Catholics. Kind of stopped going to church as often, and I fell in with a rough crowd of friends named the Baptists. <laughs> They had this fantastic gym. They had something every night of the week. They had the best food, all of it. And they had a great youth minister. And I soon began to study the Bible in ways that were quite different than the religion classes that I had growing up. And I went into my uh, history of Christianity class armed with just enough knowledge about the Bible to be terribly dangerous. Need I remind you that the root word for the word sophomore is wise fool. (laughs) Sophomoric, uh, being a wise fool. Well, the teacher of this class was a nun who they threw in with a group of 14, 15 year olds right after lunch. And she, her name was Sister Cisco. And being cruel, as teenagers can be, she earned the nickname Sister Psycho. And I would love to meet this person as an adult because I would apologize for many things, but I'm sure she is a lovely person. But she needed to get through her lectures before she would entertain or answer any questions at all. Well, coming straight from my uh, Baptist Bible study, I had lots of questions. I did not have enough wisdom to know to save those questions until the end of her lecture. So frequently my hand would shoot up and I would ask Sister Cisco, (laughs) question after question after question. Well, one afternoon right after lunch as the rest of the class was dozing off, I was wrapped with attention as we were going over this history of Holy Communion, and we had been studying in my Baptist Bible study, John chapter 6, I am the bread of life sayings like we heard this morning. And Sister Cisco was teaching us about the Roman Catholic teaching about transubstantiation and all these things that made no sense at all to a 15-year-old. And of course, in the middle of her lecture, my hand shot up and I said, but Sister Cisco, that's that's like cannibalism, record scratch. And she said, I will see you in the principal's office. (sighs) The wise fool, the sophomore, needing to learn to wait until the lecture was over to ask those sorts of questions. Well, all throughout the month of, of August, We are given these bread of life sayings of Jesus. As we talked about last week, I am the bread of life is one of the seven I am sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And it began several weeks ago when Jesus and his disciples were followed by the masses out into the middle of nowhere. And these these crowds are literally starving. They have nothing to eat. And Jesus looks to his disciples and he says, you give them something to eat. After they crunch their numbers and realize that it would take years and years of wages to feed all these people, Jesus says, let's gather up what we have and see whether it will be enough. Miraculously, thousands of people are fed with this bread. Well, Jesus is always drawing us deeper. 
In the chapters following that miracle of the feeding, Jesus begins to teach the crowds, not just about a physical bread, but by saying, I am the bread of life. And he compares himself to the manna in the wilderness, the bread that was the miracle given to the Israelites in the middle of nowhere. And he says, the bread of heaven is not like that bread. They ate that bread and they were hungry again and your ancestors died. But the kind of bread that I'm talking about, we're going to a deeper level. It's not just the bread that I fed you with up on the mountainside. It's not the manna in the wilderness. I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven to give life to the world. Jesus is drawing them deeper. I am the bread of life. It's a beautiful image, is it not? But then Jesus goes a step further and he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no life within you. I am the bread of life. And everybody begins to cock their heads and say, "Mm, I was with you with the bread of life. But I was trying to watch some of you as you heard Jesus take it that next step deeper to unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And did it make you a little uncomfortable? Did it make you squirm a little bit to think, well, that's oddly specific. We have gone from a physical bread to the bread of life to Jesus's very self, his flesh and his blood. Now, if I had been paying any attention as a 15-year-old, I would later have learned that many brilliant people have thought about this and prayed about this and written about this for ages and ages, adapting Platonic Greek philosophy to describe how Christ is present in the bread and the wine. But in that moment, as a 15-year-old, all I could think about was the literal level. And I wanted to prove how smart I was by shooting my hand up in the air and proving to my teacher that um, I knew something about John chapter 6. But Jesus is always drawing us deeper. As we are invited each and every Sunday to receive the bread and the wine, there is a moment where the person giving you communion says, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And the person giving you the chalice says, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. And the connection that I hope we can begin to make today is that it is not only the bread that we are receiving, it is that moment, it is the act of receiving Jesus that you and I begin to be transformed into the flesh and blood of Jesus, the hands and the feet, the body of Christ, both here and now, and as we spread out and go out into the world. We are saying the body of Christ, not only about what we are handing you, but by looking in your eyes and saying, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. We are following Jesus to this deeper level. Next week, we get one more Sunday of the bread of life sayings, and next week, the disciples will continue to argue and grumble and struggle to understand Jesus as he goes to the deeper levels. You notice everybody's on board when he's just talking about physical bread. People are following him in this image of, I am the bread of life. They really begin to struggle when he begins to talk about his own flesh, his own blood, his very self that is given for the life of the world. Here at All Saints, we have a vision. It gets printed on a whole bunch of things like bulletins and guest cards and such that says, embodying Christ's transforming love. 
Because I don't know about you, but I need God's love, I need God's presence to be more than just a thought or an idea or a concept. I need God's love to be, well, enfleshed. I need it to have some skin and bones. I need to know that it's not just the bread that will make me hungry again, but it is a bread that will sustain that deepest hunger in my soul. Jesus is drawing us deeper. You are the body of Christ. You are the blood of Christ to go out into the world to embody that invitation to go deeper into God's love for the world. Come and eat of this bread, says wisdom. Lay aside immaturity and live. Walk in the way of insight.